Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you here again after a year. And I like your smile, sir. Apparently, you enjoy it too. Well, that makes the two of us. All right. Uh, let me read to you a few more verses from God's Word in addition to what already has been shared. Uh, let me uh, read from uh, Daniel and the seventh chapter. I saw in the night visions, and behold, at the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. If you turn with me also to the book of Romans, and uh, specifically the second chapter, and I intend to refer to that later, we read, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And if I may turn to Revelation 5, I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strange, strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. In the sermon, I will also go to the rest of uh, the chapter, but this will do for the time being. And then chapter 11 of the Rome, uh, Revelation. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpets, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was and is, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came in the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then the Lord God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. Here ends the reading of a few passages of God's word. Let us pray that the Lord will bless our meeting this evening. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask you that you will open the windows of heaven and that the glory of God will be upon us and through us into the world as the pastor already prayed for it. And we ask you, Lord, that as we deal with the subject that is beginning to emerge even also in our churches, that it will be handled with care and also with joy to hear the word of God give the deciding verdict. That's our plea and our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when revival fires are burning, according to the promise of God in the Old Testament, rooted in the birth, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the day of Pentecost, that's revival, rooted in the work and the person of Christ, and implemented by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it is promised in the Old Testament, we always have ten vital marks. We have mighty prayer, ten days. We have mighty preaching, Peter. We have mighty conversions, 3,000. We have mighty assemblies. They all come together. It's interesting that when you have crusades today, 
and uh, people come forward, say 3,000 people come forward, you know how many people show up on Sunday? Logistically, only 5%. Now, that was totally different in the days of uh, Peter. 3,000 came forward, quote, unquote, and 3,000 ended up in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, a man by the name of C. Stanley Jones in India had 30%. He said, Lord, is there a problem with me? And the Lord seemed to say, yes, because he did not preach the full gospel. He never said, repent unto the forgiveness of sins, as Peter did in his sermon, mighty sir, preaching. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I promise you, if the gift of the Holy Spirit comes within you, you want to be in the workshop of the Holy Spirit on Sunday. And it's very interesting when we had conversions in Sunnyvale. It was never a problem with the evening service because they repented and they were uh, received forgiveness and they had the gift of the Holy Spirit. So mighty prayer, mighty conversions, mighty preaching, mighty conversions, mighty assemblies, and then in the assemblies, mighty holiness. You read Acts 2, 42 and following. And in addition to that mighty generosity, nothing was their own. So if somebody had need, no problem, they give it to you. And in addition to that mighty evangelism, as Roland Allen said, it was a spontaneous expansion of the church because their lips would always flow over. And if you and my lips don't flow over, I believe you have a problem with the presence of the Holy Spirit, whether you like it or not. We were in um, Oakland yesterday because of the problem with the plane. Our luggage didn't arrive, and we were put up in the Hilton, and the lady said to me, um, uh, you're good. And I said, lady, nobody is good except God. There was an opening shot, you know what I mean? Before the bow of her, of her ship. And he said, yes, I know, I, I know. I said, do you know the Lord Jesus? He said, yes, yes, yes. But regrettably, my son, Andrew, does not. It's a burden on my heart, you see? And you see, hear things like this. Use the opportunity. Flow, flow, flow with the gospel of Jesus so that you become comfortable. And that is exactly what happened when the Spirit of God is there. You got mighty evangelism. Wherever the people went, they talked about Jesus. And in addition to that mighty evangelism, mighty impact on society. When the apostles preached in the Jerusalem, the response was, um, you, you fill the streets of Jerusalem in the name of Jesus. And when Paul preached in Thessalonica, uh, I tell you, they became so angry uh, that they said, this is a man who, who, who um, preaches Jesus and another king, and there was an uproar in the city. And when he went to Ephesus, uh, there, was a, there was a shouting match for three hours, you see. When the gospel comes, there is an impact on society. All play takes place. And that is number nine, under mighty leadership. And number ten, in um, a mighty combat, in mighty, um, what you call, great commission combat to, to make and to train disciples. Now, brothers and sisters, the two kingdom view falls short and fights that notion of mighty impact on society. That's why I give you this introduction. And those folks are not very happy with the revival in the first place. Uh, no, 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 revival, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, it's too individualistic, and no, no, no. It, it, it leaves so much to be desired. I think they miss the biblical boat when God says, when my church starts, it is a revival church, period. Now, if you want to define revival a little differently, that, that, you know, that this, we can discuss that. But if you say a revival, no. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Now, what is behind it? You know, they have a view of uh, 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 the flow of history. And they say there are two kingdoms, not one. 
Then there are, they have two objectives, not one, and they are governed by two types of law, not by one law. Now, if you listen very carefully, brothers and sisters, uh, in the book of Revelation, you say the kingdom of the world has turned into the kingdom of God. Now, you say there seem to be two kingdoms. Oh, yes. Augustine said there were two kingdoms. Luther said there were two kingdoms. And uh, Calvin said there were two kingdoms. But they also said that they never mix. They are totally and completely antithetical. One is the kingdom of Satan, the non-elect, and the other one is the kingdom of God, the elect, and they never, ever overlap. There is a battle between the two, and that's not what the people say now who talk about two kingdoms. Uh, how do they come to that point? That's my first point. With two objectives and two types of governance, and uh, secondly, what does the Bible say? And thirdly, what impact does it make upon us? Because truth has consequences. Well, first of all, they say that God uh, put uh, Adam and Eve in paradise and gave them the cultural mandate. They must, they are created in the image of God, so they have spirituality. Then they must take dominion, they have humanity. Then, uh, brothers and sisters, they must multiply, they have sexuality. And if we look around, uh, I look at every one of you, and you have three aspects. You have spirituality, you have humanity, and you have sexuality. And God says, now when you're obedient, there's going to be a world to come, and that is what we are shooting for. Now we know when Adam and Eve fell into sin, that uh, was bankrupted. There was no more world to come for Adam and Eve and their offspring. But there is a second Adam. And the second Adam says, I am going to give you a world to come. And I do that by means of my church. And that church, brothers and sisters, has the word, has the sacraments. And through this church, the world to come is waiting for us eventually. So, but that cultural mandate is dead. Gee, the second Adam has no cultural mandate. That cultural mandate, that was uh, aborted, but Jesus takes the place now through his church for the world to come. Now that's the first thing they say. And the second thing that they say is that there is a Noahic covenant and an Abrahamic covenant. In the covenant with Noah, there is a commonality. Everybody is the same. And in the covenant uh, of Abraham, there is a speciality, if I may say, this, say, say so. You see, in the covenant of Noah, uh, there is a, um, a temporal um, uh, a, a temporal kingdom in which everybody has everything in common. Now, in the Abrahamic covenant is different. The Abrahamic covenant is spiritual and it is um, redemptive. Now, the temporal government is kind of under the state and they have a sword. But the spiritual covenant, uh, uh, a kingdom, it doesn't have a sword, it uh, turns the other cheek, you see. So there you see a divergence. Now, we live in both kingdoms. We live very happily in the commonality kingdom with everybody else. Oh, there's a difference between us and the people in that kingdom. We go to heaven and they go to hell. But nevertheless, there is a great deal of commonality. Well, we all build chairs. We all do arithmetic, and there is nothing Christian about that. Uh, uh, it, 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 there, there is a commonality, and the God says, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy um, your youth, enjoy your life, all those wonderful things. They are uh, with you, and uh, we are working together for the well-being, the physical well-being of the people in that realm. 
uh, we build roads, we, we uh, uh, sell uh, cell phones, uh, we put computers up, you know. Now, don't tell me that it's not well-being. Huh? Can you imagine if the air conditioning would conk out right now? Ooh. Now, here it is not so, so hot. But I'll tell you, if you are in India, uh, where there's 112 degrees, or in Death Valley, 126, or in, or in Southern California, oh, man, it, be, it deals with the well-being of, of people. So be happy about that well-being. And we all are totally together there. But don't say that is a Christian thing. No. That is the king, the temporal kingdom, the Noahic covenant. And God continues the world through the Noahic covenant. But then, in the, uh, in the spiritual kingdom, you come into the church, and there you have the word, you have the sacrament, and eventually you're being made ready uh, for the world to come uh, in everlasting life. Now, uh, there are two independent purposes, therefore. Two kingdoms, two independent purposes. The one is the well-being of uh, physically, and the other one is the spiritual well-being. And those two kingdoms are governed uh, by two different laws. Uh, the, the natural kingdom, uh, the, the, the temporal kingdom, is uh, governed by natural law that bubbles up in which all the, everybody kind of agrees. You know, uh, you have to have stop signs. You have to have, uh, uh, you can yeah, put pre people in prison. Uh, now, where does that come from? How, how is it possible? that people agree on that natural law that is seems to be ingrained in everybody all right uh, that, but in the church is different there you apply biblical law um, and uh, don't uh, say uh, that you can apply biblical law in uh, society because uh, to be very frank with you people don't even know what the Bible is all about and so that is mixing apples and oranges so two kingdoms they are separate. Now, they want to keep it together, and they say, well, really, the, the physical kingdom uh, is under Christ as the mediator of creation, and the spiritual kingdom is under the kingship of Christ as mediator of redemption. But that kind of papers over the differences. There are two differences, and the one may not go into the other to the point that even in the General Assembly, my brother said uh, a few minutes ago, and somebody said, let's pray for a P POW in, um, in, uh, so in one of the countries there for five years in the General Assembly. Somebody got up, oh, that belongs to a different kingdom. The church really should not be involved in that. You see, so that shows you how serious that is. So here is a, a flow of history, all right? Adam messed up. Christ is now the second Adam, and he gets you ready for heaven. Now, in the meantime, there is a common kingdom um, with a, uh, uh, its own purpose and its own governance on the one hand, and there is an other kingdom, and that is the spiritual kingdom, and that um, has the spiritual well-being of people in mind, and that goes uh, by the biblical law, the law of Moses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is that really biblical? Well, let me tell you. I know that Adam messed up. We know all that. And after a number of years, maybe a thousand or two, three thousand years, God saw that mankind was totally and completely bankrupt. And he said, I am sorry I made you. And I'm going to wipe you all out. Where do we hear about a common kingdom there, uh, which is wonderful and which must develop, no, oh, God says, you under my kingship. I am king over everything. And I don't like what you're doing and who you are. And I'm going to judge you. And we're going to destroy everybody. Now, I was in the General Assembly of the Reformed Baptist Churches once. 
uh, as, a, as an, uh, a, pre a representative of a representative of Covenant College, and I said, if I would have lived before the flood, I would have drowned. And they all began to laugh. And I didn't understand that. And then I looked at him and I so would you. All of mankind has rebelled against the kingship of God. And, and they are told that they are rebels. And you find that in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Kiss the sun, or you will perish in the world. There's not just a nice commonality there, brothers and sisters. And, God, and it may develop all by itself, and you may be happy. No, 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 no. The Bible says that the Lord God is angry with the wicked all day long. As he wiped him out, ladies and gentlemen. And were it not for one man, we would not have been here. His name was Noah and his family. And then God says, I'm going to start the Abrahamic covenant. And I'm going to start with Israel. I give him the Mosaic covenant. And you know what God says? I know that after Moses is dead, you're going to rebel. And I'm going to kick you out of the land in my fierce anger. That's exactly what he did. In the exile, everybody was kicked out, and only a remnant was left over. Very few. The Lord started with two and a half million in on Mount Sinai, and by the time people returned from the exile, there were only less than 50,000 left. Now, I promise you, Pastor, if you are a member of this church with two and a half million people, and after a thousand years, you would owe only 50,000 50, left. <laughs> I think they would have fired you long, uh, long before that. All right, all right. You see, that, that is, and then what happened to the people who were able to return? God destroyed everybody in uh, the year 70 A.D. In, in Jerusalem. He wiped them all out, my dear brothers and sisters. And then we come and see the book of Revelation. And there you see a different view of the flow of world history. There's a scroll with seven seals. Now that scroll is the book of the history of the world. Now mind you, in the fourth chapter, you have the worship of the Father. Holy, holy, holy. And the people fall down before him. Submission to the dominion of God, to the dominion of God, to the kingship of God. All the four creatures as the representatives of the total creation and the 24 elders as the representatives of the total redeemed people of God both fall down on their to, upon, before one king, the dominion of God, and they cast all their crowns before the Lord, and they burst out in praise to God. And then chapter 5, the weeping prophet. The weeping apostle. Now, why does he weep? You know, you ask yourself the question, who can bail us out? And God d drowned everybody. Who can bail us out? Well, it was one man. Some bailout, huh? Some bailout. A stop gap measure. Because his children, uh, you know what, what happened to them? And they ended up in the Tower of Babel. And God had to disperse them. And if he had not promised that he would not destroy the earth with water again, he would have, he would have done so as to disperse them again. And then we have a new beginning, all right, with Abraham. Now finally something is going to blossom out. Well, after a thousand years, two thousand years, what happened? They all were kicked out. And now John stands there before God and says, Lord, it looks like that all of mankind is a dead end street. Who is able to bail us out so that this world will continue? Who? Nobody. 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 Not in heaven. Not under heaven. Not in, on the earth. Not under the earth. And John weeps. Now let me ask you. Does that apply to us today? Who can bail us out? Can Obama bail us out? Huh? Or Bush? Who can bail us out? 
Who can bail out Modesto? Nobody. Nobody. And when you come face to face with them, you pray about bringing the gospel to others. The Apostle Paul knows the enemies of the cross, and I believe you, me, all those people before the flood were enemies of the cross, quote, unquote. And believe you me, all the people in the Old Testament were enemies of the cross, quote, unquote. And all the people before the destruction of 70 AD, they were enemies of the cross. And their end is destruction. Because they only go after earthly things, commonality, building roads, etc., etc. Those are earthly things. Their glory is their shame, and their belly is their, their, uh, is, their, is their problem because their appetite is their problem. We want to make progress, and you know there's never any progress. The Chinese Empire is gone. The, the, uh, the Soviet Union Empire is gone. The British Empire is gone. Uh, uh, Microsoft is going to go downhill uh, if uh, the iPad and everything else takes over. Uh, Microsoft is already wobbly, all right? And uh, Dell tried to buy out his company, and somebody said, I pay more. And then there are 10, 15 percent less sales in uh, um, uh, uh, computers. And they said, we, we back out because it, the time of uh, the personal computer is gone. It's all, nothing is going to last. And even in uh, football or whatever, or in basketball, you know, you're the king of the hill, and you come uh, 20 years later, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Los Angeles Lakers, you know, they were going to last forever. Now nah, they're going to go down. Ladies and gentlemen, don't bet upon that kind of a horse. A communal world where everything is hunky-dory, and we're going to develop it, and we're going to make progress. The Lord says, who can bail us out? Nobody can bail us out. Nobody. They're all tempor temporal, temporary victories. You do something, and you succeed in something, and you say, well, that is my life. Well, you die. What is your life? It's not going to work. And John weeps, and we must weep for a nation and for a world where the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the answer, because he receives word, the lion lamb, the lion, the king, who is at the same time the lamb. He is the only one who can bail us out. And he is the king, and the ancient of days gives all the kingdom and all the glory to him so that he will rule. And brothers and sisters, just before he is, uh, ascends into the heavens, he says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. And that does not uh, mean that the communal um, uh, kingdom is not under his authority, direct authority. Brothers and sisters, the Old Testament is clear. When the nations refuse to bow before the Lord God, you read all the prophecies in Isaiah and in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, they are being destroyed, brothers and sisters. There is no such a nice communal place where we can work together and everything is hunky-dory and the Noahic covenant, brothers and sisters, uh, 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 lays the foundation for that. No. In the Noahic Covenant, God says, you must continue the cultural mandate. You must continue to multiply. And I give you some more to, uh, food to eat, okay, but you must continue. You are spiritual beings. You must take dominion, and you must multiply. That's going to continue. But you know what the Bible also says? And God says, when I go into the future, I am not going to curtail my cultural mandate. You people are supposed to do that. You're doomed if you don't. If you don't want to work, you won't eat. Amen? But you're also doomed if you do, because everything is vanity. And now you see what this world is all about. Doomed when we don't work, we won't eat. 
doomed if we do work because it's all in vain, as Romans says, is subjected to vanity by God. Ecclesiastes is clear. Everything is vain. He looks left, he looks right, he looks up, he looks down. All right? Young people, what is your future? Ah, we're going to get a college degree. We are going to get married. We are going to get a job. We are going to get children. We are going to. The Bible says it's vain. It's vanity. It's empty, empty, empty. Unless you're under the kingship of God. And the kingship of Jesus. Because the Ancient of Days gives all the kingship to our Savior over all the nations, over all the languages, over every societal sphere, also the state, also your local council. It's all under the kingship of Jesus. And if you don't kiss him, you may build roads, but it's in vain. It's going to disappear. If you don't bow before the kingship of Jesus, if you do not bow for the only king that covers the totality of this world, you have no future. So that's why I preach the gospel. Because you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born again. And you know what, the, what it means to be born again? You must have a heart transplant. That's what the, uh, Ezekiel says. I'll take the heart of stone out or give you a heart of flesh. And as I said last year, the Bible says that the heart is terrible. The heart is uh, deceitful above all things. Out of it comes all the junk that the Lord Jesus is talking about, fornication, murder, gossip, complaining, abs bitterness, etc., etc. It's the mission control center. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. That's why God says in Genesis 6, I'm going to wipe them all out because all the thoughts of their hearts are only evil continually. And the psalmist says, like a cobra. Now, would you like to have a cobra in your house? Would you like to have a cobra in your house? That's why God doesn't want you into the kingdom as you are. But he says, I give that heart to Jesus and ask him to kill it on the cross. And out of, out of the grave comes the heart of Jesus and is implanted within you. And it doesn't make any difference whether you are in the chamber of commerce or whether you are ever, you have a new heart. Uh, you are under the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ because you know that apart from his kingship, everything is vain. Now, of course, God says you must take dominion. You must continue. So you work together with others to put street lights on. And, and, to, and to take stoplights, of course. But you say at the same time to those dear friends, uh, you know, it is vanity if you don't put it under the Lord Jesus Christ. Doomed if you do go as you are, and I'm going to preach the gospel to you, because the time will come that if you don't kiss the sun and all that, you will perish. If you don't become a friend of the cross that get rid of that old heart and get a heart of Jesus, you have no future, because you think of earthly things. Oh, they're wonderful. They're wonderful. A fan, um, uh, air conditioning, uh, roads that are not uh, bumpy like in Uganda, at least, uh, or they have no roads at all. There are so many uh, potholes that people say only drunken people uh, drive straight. <laughs> Everybody else drives around it, you see. Uh, you, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. When I was there f after uh, the first time I came back to the United States, I virtually collapsed in the airport. It, 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 was, it was terrible. So when you come here, it is so wonderful. And if I say that it's vanity, do you young people understand that? Well, I talked about common grace, in, um, and I cannot say much about it, but common grace has two aspects. Common grace, all those things are gifts of God, okay? But the Bible says, even the light of the wicked is wicked. Even the light of the wicked is darkness. As a gift of God, the roads are wonderful and enjoy them by all means. But as a per product of man, they're at the same time utterly wicked. as poisonous. So when I take this, take this chair, I said, uh, I love this chair, but you're a piece of poison. 
as it is produced by men. And you know how I can prove that? Because it, the Bible says it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So you are rich. And that rich becomes poison. And you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, all grace comes from above. Sin comes from below, but common grace comes from both from above and from below. It's wonderful as a gift of God. It is horrible as a product of man, and it's going to kill you. That is why when the roads came into Uganda, and the telephones were there, and the kids could drive again, and the, and the parents could sit on the lawns, you know how many people we got in, a, in meetings? Bef when everything was impossible, we had 600 girls, all, all of them. And when everything was in, it was reduced to 300. And there were 600 girls, we had dozens of conversions, because all the unbelievers came too. But when, when the roads were in, they're all Christians. And the number of conversions went way down. Now don't tell me, don't tell me that the roads were poison. They were both gifts and poison. So when you have, a, when, when you have a, an education, they're both a gift of God and they're also poison. Because when you're educated, you know, that's what God says. You go into the new land and you find homes that you didn't put up. Don't, tell, don't forget me and don't, uh, don't think that I didn't give it to you. You know, you have something and you have arrived. Do you know that moral people are much harder to evangelize than people in prison? I say into prison, you have a cobra heart. And you know what they say? Yes, I know. And when I tell a moral man who uh, everything takes care of everything and gives everybody his due, you have a cobra heart. Wait a minute. I saw it in Sunnyvale. A dying man talking about his sins. And I gave everybody his due. Don't talk to him about sin. He said, did you give God your, his due? And he said to his wife, I'm tired. Show the man to go. I tell you. Everything, time that you have something, I promise you, I promise you, it is p potential poison because you're going to lean on it. And I sometimes, you know, I, have, I am getting a, a, a monthly stipend out of my, uh, out of my um, uh, retirement fund, and I really trust the Lord, you know. But what if all the money dries up? What if Obama says we can no longer pay our bills, so all the money and uh, all the plans that you have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to use it to pay our bills and I have nothing left. What am I going to say? I'm going to say to James that the rich man rejoices that he has everything and the poor man rejoices that he has nothing. We see that all this earthly stuff that we may enjoy the earthly, but we may not be focused on the earthly. And I promise you, 90% of the people are, are in, in, uh, focused on earthly things 90% of the time. I asked uh, 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 some students in Malawi, um, you're, you're, the Bible says, you don't ask, if, uh, that's why you don't have. And if you say, well, I do ask, well, because you do it for your own pleasure. How much of your, of your prayers are for your own pleasure? For, for your own happiness. And the, the next day, regrettably, there are two young women, there are no males, and they said, we came to the conclusion that 95% of our prayers are for our own happiness. They said, that's, that's the world, uh, the commonality of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Please, don't fall victim to it, young people, because it's gonna kill you, it's gonna kill you, it's gonna kill you. And the only way to recognize that what uh, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments. And so you begin to see the flow of world history beginning to develop. There are no two kingdoms, one common with, in which we share with everybody, and that is a kind of a neutral area. And then there is one uh, that is the church. And we, but the people in the church do not really affect that they are opposed to redeeming the culture. They are opposed to uh, transforming the culture. Now, I know you cannot redeem a culture technically. You can only redeem the people. But I promise you, when revival fires are burning and people come in great numbers, their culture is going to change. Because of the emphasis and the presence of the dominion of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So there are no two kingdoms. They are separate from each other. There is only one kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. There are no two different, different purposes, uh, happiness on the one hand and holiness on the other. No. And that's what I get uh, from John. And I return to the book of Revelation when, uh, when uh, John weeps and he's told the lion lamb he is the king and a priest. Now, what does he do? What is he doing, ladies and gentlemen? He says, I am going to go to this cross to produce a church. That is the great bailout. Not health insurance, but a church, Jesus. And when I talk to people outside, I say, you know why you are, why you are here and you're there? I said, well, I was born in, no, no, no. Why do you exist there? Because there's a church in Stenderford Road. The only reason why the world continues. The world has no independent purpose. It is good for nothing. It is only the spawning ground for the church. And we must use the world as the fishing pond for the church. And if we understand what the Word of God says, and we recognize the world, it must continue in a Sisyphus labor. They pull up the rocks and it falls back again and again and again, already 10,000 years. But God says if we don't continue to continue the world uh, 50, 60 years ago, I could never save you because you wouldn't be around. So I use the word as a spawning ground for the church of Jesus. And the Bible says, if you are taken out, then you are kings and priests with a small K and a small P, little lions and lambs, and now you are being used to turn to the world as a fishing ground and to take the fish out, and that's why you evangelize. So that the church will continue. That's the only reason why this world consists, exists. And if you are not under the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are heading for destruction, and we should tell the people. And people say, now, why does God give all those common graces today? Uh, you know, it, it, life is so pleasant. In the day of judgment, God is going to change. And Paul says, oh, no. You know why he gives you common graces? To tone down the cobra hearts. Isn't that wonderful that it's not a holocaust every day? Tones, it tones it down. I promise you, if there were no common graces with nice chairs and nice this and nice that and skills and, and abilities, you see, and everything would be raunchy, everybody would be in each other's hair. And so God calms down society, uh, and then the society turns around and says, well, you're so wonderful. No, you're not going to judge us in the day of judgment. And God said, don't you understand? I, I begin to tone down um, uh, the cobra heart with my common graces a and it is designed to lead you to repentance that you recognize without this common grace it will be a holocaust every day it will be a hellhole every day oh Lord God our eyes are open and we flee to the kingship of Jesus in the chamber of commerce as we put up um, uh, put up um, uh, uh, traffic lights uh, we know it's all vanity, but we, dominion taking, must continue, so we do it. But we re recognize that we are doomed if we do and doomed if we don't, unless we fear God and keep his commandments. Now, is that natural law? I conclude with this. Not two kingdoms, one kingdom. Psalm 2, Daniel, Revelation. One kingdom. Kiss the sun wherever you are or you will perish in any aspect of reality. One kingdom only. One purpose. Namely, the production of the bride of the person of Jesus. That's why you only receive children to make the members of the local church. And if you understand that, you take them to Sunday school. If you don't, what do you do? They're going after your happiness. Huh? I uh, have to sleep in this morning or, or whatever. Uh, 
our brothers and sisters, those are earthly things. If you go after earthly things, as a, it's an idolatry. You're idolaters when you do that. When you become upset, for instance, when somebody cuts you off, uh, <laughs> you're in God's hands, right? As a rich man, I rejoice that everything is going to be taken away. I'm rich, I have, I have the road, and now he cuts me off. I become a little poor. Let the rich man rejoice that everything is going to be taken away from me. Uh, do, you, do you act like that? I see people all the time. They murmur, they complain, and they talk, and they, com and they, are, and they are critical, and they chai, look at that, and they don't understand. Brothers and sisters, that when you are rich, you must, you, must, you must praise God that everything is going to be taken away from you. Some people a little, from some people a little faster than others. And if you're poor, you have everything. I, have, I miss my plane, I have everything. Why would I complain? And how many, do, how many people do that? They kill my spirit when they complain. It kills my spirit. Because it's it just uh, 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 ugly, ugly, ugly to the core. And you have to repent of that. Lord, one kingdom. Not my own kingdom here, com communal with others. One kingdom, and I want to kiss the sun and everything. And if I'm rich, I praise the Lord that everything is going to be taken away from me. And if I'm poor, I uh, praise the Lord because I have everything in Him. That is a glory, ladies and gentlemen. And there is one purpose. The purpose is that God is going to get himself a bride so you produce children to make a members of the local church and the local church um, trains you to become members of the great bride of Jesus. Now how about the last point? The Romans, the second chapter, tells us uh, that they do the works of the law. I know that people don't, that believers and unbelievers say, well, we need a traffic light, all right? But is that a natural law that bubbles up in which everybody agrees? Oh, they may agree in a few points. But let me give the example of the headhunters. If you live in a headhunter's village, you're absolutely safe because they don't believe in murder. If anybody tries to murder you in the village, they go after your hide. But now they step outside of them different story. Do they believe in you shall not murder? Of course. Do they believe in you shall not steal? Of course. Do they believe you shall not commit adultery? Of course. Do they believe in all they have their own decalogue? Well, then you ask for the application. It flies in their face. You can trust communists to be a communist. There's a booklet. Very interesting. They are against murder. Or you can murder capitalists. Everybody's against murder. As Thomas Aquinas already said, everybody's against uh, adultery. But if it's pleasing to you, go ahead. There is no such a thing as a universal ethic. As somebody the other day said on the radio, everybody has only a flexible ethic. That is why uh, Republicans and Democrats always fight together. That is why people in the chamber of of uh, common whatever, they, if, if they disagree, they fight together, and they cannot get a, co a commonality. There is no such thing as a natural law. When you ask people to define it, they cannot define it, and they say the works of the law. Yes, the works of the law, but they don't have the law written on the heart. They say you shall not steal, but what they do is not stealing. The works of the law, not the law. And the works of the law is a kind of common grace that people still take dominion in somewhat of a bearable way. But if they don't bow before the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise you, you're going to get uh, Obama telling us that same-sex marriages is a must for our society. And he goes into Africa and he chides the people for being ugly toward homosexuals as if those people have, uh, have not b bigger problems than that, quote, unquote. You see, that is, that is the kingdom of Satan. And that is why we read that the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our God. 
There is no intermixing in the kingdom of Satan. The satanic influence of the kingdom of Satan is everywhere in society. And in God's common grace, it may, it's nice that from time to time we agree in terms of traffic lights, etc., etc. But don't think that that is going to be an independent purpose or that is going to sanitize society. It is not. All those kingdoms disappear. But there's only one kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the, for the purpose of producing a church that is going to be in the pre very presence of the Lord. And it, he runs the world by biblical law. He says to the state that you're a, a servant of God and you have to take care of the good and you have to suppress the wicked. And you know, a minister in the cabinet of, 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 of Uganda told me, uh, we must do that job, but the church must tell us what is good and what is bad. Now, I know that they don't listen to the church, but that's not the issue. The issue is that the church says, you are under biblical law. That is the law of the king. And if you don't love God for who he is, the first commandment, if you don't love God for what he says, the second commandment, if you don't love God for what he does, I am going to destroy you as he destroyed, according to the prophecies by Jeremiah and Ezekiel, all the nations of the earth. There was no nice commonality uh, kingdom, not at all. He said, I am willing to give you common grace. I am willing to, uh, to subdue the wickedness. But if you are not going to fear me and if you are not going to keep my commandments, it is over. It is over. Now, how then should we live? We should tell our children that there's only one kingdom and only one purpose and only one law. And I cannot, this is a flow of history. I, I have not been able to define kingdom. I have not been able to define uh, purpose, church, and, uh, and law. It is systematic theology. This is biblical theology. Biblical theology gives you the flow of the word. Of the word. And without systematic theology, you, you, you're, not, you're not going to see the fine points. So you need systematic theology. But you also need a, a, the flow of biblical theology and to know where systematic theology is going. I could only give you biblical theology. So please remember, remember, that you tell your children there's only one kingdom, one King Jesus. He has all the authority on heaven and earth. And if you don't bow down before him, you're history. You have no future. And everything you do, it is utter vanity. And even if you're a Christian, it's vanity. Unless you put the fear of God in it and you handle, uh, God's, uh, God, God's, handle it according to God's commandments, then you're going to show the world a transformed culture because it's informed by the fear of God, driven by the fear of God, and it is shown, covered by the commandments of God. Under the kingship of Jesus is the purpose of the church. Please, please, young people, the great purpose in life is not like Solomon, that you are able to run a nation and that you are able to write books on zoology uh, because when he is old, he goes after other gods and the kingdom is removed. And I say to myself, if he had only asked for a holiness, he would not have multiplied horses, he would not have multiplied gold, he wouldn't have multiplied by the women, and, he would, and that would have been a culture of beauty that would be visible. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is why I can, I think, I would like to have an indictment against this notion of two kingdoms and two purposes and two laws. It goes against my grain from beginning to end. There's only one king over everything. You bow before him in everything or it is over. It's only one purpose why God continued this world. Not because he, want, he, he, he thinks it's so nice for the development. No, the only purpose is that the church of Jesus, that the world is a spawning ground for the church of Jesus and the church is going to use it as a fishing ground. That's the only purpose. There's only one law that cover, governs everything. And that is the law of God. And if you listen, you'll be blessed. If you don't listen, you'll be cursed. Now, what is our takeaway? First of all, let me tell this to our children. One king, 
one purpose and one law. And secondly, the Bible says, if you want to get this takeaway, you place yourself under the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ in everything, in everything. You make the purpose of Jesus your purpose. So you're going to become evangelistic. And you go into the world. But if you don't know how to do it, you're going to have to be trained. And I believe that everybody should be certified in evangelism. Not, not done. We have, a do and I uh, said to a man this afternoon, I want people to become comfortable to speak about Jesus. And most people are not. So they have to learn that. And if they don't want to learn that, I believe you go after earthly things. Because you want this, you want that, but you don't want the purpose for which Jesus puts this world together, keeps this world going. Uh, to make a church. Lord, if you are here to prove the church, and then you want me to be your co-laborer and uh, to be a, a co-ambassador of Jesus and instrument in the Holy Spirit, I want to learn how to do it. And I don't want to postpone it. I want to do it. I tell in Uganda, how do you spell uh, tomorrow? And they say, T-O-M-O-R-R-O-W. I said, no, you spell T-A-D-A-Y. And how do you spell today? T-O-D-A-Y. I said, no, Y-E-S-T-E-R-D-A-Y. -E -E and they get the point. They already have postponed. Why do you think you lost the Middle East? Why do you think you lost Europe? Why do you think you have, are losing the United States? Oh, you can say the problems of God, and that's true. But don't hide the falsehood behind the truth. God says, if you lose, if you, if you lose it means that you don't want to be man of mighty prayer, mighty preaching, and you don't go after mighty conversions, and mighty assemblies, and mighty holiness, and mighty generosity, and mighty evangelism, and mighty impact on society, and a mighty leadership, and mighty great commission combat, and revive, that revival comes, I promise you, you're going to get immense numbers of conversions. I saw that in Uganda. You know how many Anglicans that there are right now? 12 million. You know when they started? In 1870. The revival fires were burned. And the revival fires are burning. There are always between 10 and 20 million conversions in 100 years. That's our shame, brothers and sisters. I plead, I plead with you. If you believe in the one kingship and the one pur purpose and the one law, you say, Lord, I want to be down, I want to be bow before your kingship every day of my life. I want to be co-laborer in terms of getting that purpose ab abro abroad and all over the world. And I want to listen to your law and wherever I go, and I prepare for marriage or whatever, I want to ask you, Lord, I fear you. What does it mean to do your commandment? If you believe in the two kingdoms, the two purposes, and the two laws, you undercut making disciples to get a church and training disciples to make them obedient to God to his kingdom. And so it may be difficult and dangerous to say, but I would not mind to prefer churches against them with a view to finally get the discussion going. What is it all about? Or possibly a study group. But brothers and sisters, the two kingdom view it cuts the Great Commission down, it truncates it. it, does not understand the utter glorious kingship of Christ over everything. Not one square inch of this world of which Jesus doesn't say it is mine. He doesn't understand the purpose of life. The purpose why God puts up with this world. It is bankrupt. It's because he says, I'm going to need it to produce a church. And then that church is going to be dressed in white raiments. The righteous of the saints are going to join the Lord Jesus. His hair white as wool. Brothers and sisters, if that doesn't come in the OPC, if it doesn't come in, in me, 
I don't think that we're ever able to stem the tide of this culture, which has increasingly become a kingdom of this world. Where the kingship of Jesus is not honored, where the purpose of Jesus' kingship is not honored, and where the biblical law is not honored. And we see even our young people disappearing. Oh, it's terrible. In Uganda, there are so many people that it's kind of cultural to go to church, but in, Uga in our in our nation, no longer. In nearly every family, we have people, children and grandchildren, who turn away from the Lord. Like a lady in Hilton yesterday said, my son Andrew, it's a burden of my life. You have to go back to one kingdom, one purpose, one law, and then bow under that kingship, stand next to Jesus to produce that purpose as his instrument. Kings and priests with a small K and a small P, and then pleading with God that we will be holy before him all the days of our lives, in everything, wherever we are. We may be persecuted, because that's what Jesus said. We may kill us, but when we fill the streets of Jerusalem in the name of Jesus, we're going to get people to object. When you go into Ephesus and people lose their livelihood because no goddesses of uh, Diana are being sold anymore in silver, that's what we're going to get. And we are going to be ready for the kingdom to move under mighty leadership and mighty great commission combat. Let me pray. Father God, in the